Hello, and welcome to this week's Ethical Dilemma in Science. I'm John Hoffman, Professor of Biology, and this week we're going to take a look at silencing the echo chamber and popping the epistemic bubble. Who do you trust for your information? So taking a little bit of a detour from focusing in primarily on science and ethics and taking a little bit more of a look at differing uh, perspectives and how to deal with differing perspectives. So to start out with, uh, the kind of introduction to this uh, is going to be taking a look at Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, who is the new White House uh, press secretary as of uh, mid-May, uh, a number of firsts uh, in her appointment to this position. So she's the first uh, black woman, uh, first openly LGBTQ person uh, in this role. Uh, and, and so it's, it's uh, exciting to see this uh, type of representation going on within the White House. And so if we take a look at uh, her first press conference, hopefully this will load up quickly, work well earlier. Uh, and so just look at a, a quick excerpt of this because we're going to take a look at this from a, a variety of perspectives. Hi, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The president's Twitter account posted the other day, you want to bring down inflation and let's make sure the wealthiest corporations pay their fair share. How does raising taxes on corporations reduce inflation? Um, so, are you talking about a specific tweet? He tweeted, you want to bring down inflation, let's make sure the wealthiest corporations pay their fair share. Look, you know, we have talked about, um, we have talked about this this past year, uh, about uh, making sure that the wealthiest among us are paying their fair share. Um, and, um, and that, that is, is important, important to do, to do. and, and uh, that, that is something that, that uh, you, know, you know, the president, president has been, been you know, working, working on uh, every day when we talk about inflation and lowering costs. costs. And so, so it's, it's very important uh, that, uh, uh, you know, as, as we're seeing costs rise, uh, as, as we're, we're talking, talking about how to, to you know, uh, you know, build an America that's safe, that's equal for everyone and doesn't leave everyone behind, that is an important part of that as well. But how does raising taxes on corporations lower? Or the cost of gas, the cost of a used car, the cost of food for everyday Americans. So look, I think we encourage those who have done very well. Right? Right. Especially, Especially those who, who care, care about climate change, change uh, to, to support, support a fair ta tax code that, that doesn't change, that doesn't charge manufacturers, workers, cops, builders, a higher percentage of their earnings, that the most fortunate people in our nation, and not let this, this is that stand in the way of reducing energy costs and fighting this ex existential problem, if you think about that as an example. And to support basic collective bargaining rights as well, right? That's also important. But look, it is, you know, by, by not, not if, without, without having, having a fair tax, tax code, code, which is what I'm talking, talking about, about, then all the, 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 every, like, like manufacturing, manufacturing workers, cops, you know, you know it's, it's not, not fair, fair for them, them to have to pay higher taxes than, than the folks that who are who are who are, who are not paying taxes at all. Well, what what happened with inflation? The president said, "You want to bring down inflation? Let's make sure the wealthiest corporations pay their fair share." Jeff Bezos came out and tweeted about that. He said the newly created disinformation board should review this tweet. Would you be okay with that? Look, Look, it's, it's not, not a huge mystery, mystery why one of the wealthiest individuals on Earth, right, right opposes an economic agenda uh, that is for the middle class that cuts some of the biggest cost families face, fights inflation for the long haul, right, and that's, and that's what we're talking about. about. That's why we're, we're talking about uh, lowering inflation here. And adds to the historic deficit reduction the president is achieving by asking the richest taxpayers and corporations to pay their fair share. That is what we're talking about. Okay, and then just one on the trip. Okay, so, uh, you know, first day on the job, um, got a, a question, you know, you could evaluate the answer, whether or not it answered the question, whether or not, you know, it, it was appropriate uh, based on your own judgment. Uh, but then we take a look at the, the news accounts that go along with this. Uh, and so the first one, I've got an example here, uh, a Fox News report uh, from that day. Uh, this report actually was just uh, highlighting a bunch of tweets uh, that came out from people. Uh, so this is excruciating to watch. Uh, you start a sentence and see where it takes you regardless of the question that you were asked. Uh, and then finally down here, kind of big yikes. Uh, and so basically, you know, from this perspective, you know, not a, not a favorable uh, kind of review, not a favorable grade uh, for the answer on uh, this first day in the position. Take another look. Uh, this is The Guardian uh, in the UK, actually the US edition of The Guardian. 
Uh, Ducey was the uh, journalist that asked the question, uh, challenged it. Uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, the, the press secretary, uh, did not seem uh, quite as nimble uh, as uh, the previous uh, press secretary, John uh, Saki, uh, and, and basically went on and said, you know, gave you know, a little bit of an answer here and then went on in a wonky fashion. Uh, so, you know, maybe a little bit more neutral uh, in this position, but again, you know, dropping in the term wonky here kind of is a, is a term uh, that's often used to apply to, you know, uh, political speech, uh, you know, to uh, politicians, you know, kind of answering a question without really answering the question, maybe going around the issue, but getting points out uh, that they would like to do. And that's a, a strategy that you can see often in uh, political speech. Another example here, uh, the Gazette, uh, day of first, uh, her first dust up with one of her interlockers, you know, kind of referring to Ducey as a member of, of uh, Fox News, a member of the Free Press, uh, as, you know, a potential adversary. Uh, Jean-Pierre uh, appeared to get caught flat-footed by the question about how raising corporate taxes uh, would uh, combat inflation. So again, a, you know, a slightly different perspective, uh, taking a look at that. Uh, going on here, uh, LGBTQ Nation, uh, Peter Ducey is going to learn quickly that Corinne uh, Jean-Pierre is just as smart and tough as Jen, uh, Jen Psaki. Uh, so taking a more favorable uh, approach to the response uh, and the interaction uh, that occurred. Uh, finally, uh, a, a different opinion here uh, from the Huffington Post, uh, basically saying, you know, do America a favor, stop uh, Stop calling on these people uh, to ask these questions because of the, you know, potentially adversarial relationship uh, do, uh, uh, involved, um, you know, and, you know, basically the, the Republican uh, versus the Democrat, uh, Fox News versus, uh, you know, different news like CNN, uh, different perspectives, conservative versus liberal. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I don't, you know, encourage this response because I don't think shutting off uh, communication at, at any point uh, is a good answer for this. Uh, in this, and again, this is an opinion within the Huffington Post, uh, some pin pundits have already criticized her response as being uh, for inefficiency, uh, but no answer could be sufficient for Ducey and the network he works for. Uh, so again, uh, kind of coming up with a differing response. Uh, again, because I want to uh, approach this by taking a look at different perspectives, uh, again, you know, in the importance of looking at different perspectives, the importance of having uh, kind of civil and respective discourse, uh, especially in matters that we disagree with one another. Uh, just a couple uh, other accounts. This was actually before her first day. Uh, this is, uh, again, from the Huffington Post, uh, going full bigot, uh, assess uh, her qualifications. Uh, so, you know, attacking the person uh, as opposed to what the person is doing. Uh, and then after this, uh, and this is a uh, uh, Russian media outlet, uh, basically very offensively uh, referring to her uh, as a dark-skinned immigrant. Uh, and in the translations, which according to the Newsweek account that I read on this, uh, they've, and I haven't added this, this is actually in the sub, uh, the headings and closed captioning, uh, they'll replace her with a white heterosexual male. Uh, so again, not, you know, uh, arguing against the points that she's being made, uh, but attacking the person. And, and so that's definitely not uh, a, a civil and respectful approach uh, that we need to be doing if we're going to have reasonable conversation uh, about differing ideas. Bring that on the wrong screen, bring this back. Uh, and so this, you know, is the introduction, or at least the, 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 the kind of seed that I was working with uh, to come up with this, silencing the echo chamber and popping the uh, epistemic bubble, who do you trust uh, for your information? Uh, and, and like I said, I've been struggling with this concept uh, for a couple weeks now. Uh, I started thinking about this uh, when uh, the leak of the Alito Roe versus Wade uh, decision came out, uh, and you start reading news accounts associated with this, and you start reading opinions that are being published. And, and again, I recognize that some of these uh, are opinion pieces, some of these are news pieces, uh, but for a, a vast majority uh, of the American public, they're going to be looking for information uh, and they may not necessarily pick up what is going to be opinion, uh, what is a news uh, account, what has you know potentially biased perspectives uh, that are included uh, with the reporting that is going to be going on. Uh, and so over here, a New York Post uh, headline here, again, both of these are going to be opinions. Uh, Alito makes a masterful argument to over to overturn uh, Roe versus 
weight. Uh, and in the, the, the statement, uh, pulling out quotes from the, the Alito uh, draft uh, uh, ruling, uh, Roe was egregiously wrong uh, from the start. Uh, so basically taking the, the position, it's about time, uh, let's overthrow Roe versus Wade. Uh, on the other side of this, I, again, this is a, an NBC uh, product, uh, an opinion there, Alito's Roe attack betrays medieval ignorance of ancient history. Uh, and, and so taking a very, very different mindset, very different view and perspective uh, on this argument. Uh, and we can see, you know, potentially why, you know, the public's polarized, uh, because there are very, very strong opinions on either side. And depending upon where they're getting their information, they may be uh, getting their views amplified uh, or challenged uh, in some way. Uh, at that point, I wasn't really really wanting to get into this topic uh, as much, uh, just because uh, the abortion issue is is highly controversial, highly uh, emotional, uh, and because of that, it becomes very, very difficult to uh, have discussions around that kind of centered on the facts uh, without bringing emotion into it. Sadly, uh, about a week, or I guess a couple weeks later, uh, about a week ago now uh, that I'm recording this, um, I think the third week of May uh, in 2022, uh, we had the Buffalo shooting. Uh, we had uh, an individual uh, kind of drive a distance uh, in order to shoot up a grocery store uh, in a black neighborhood, uh, specifically targeting targeting uh, people based on their race. Uh, before he did that, uh, he wrote, uh, like as many of these people do, uh, wrote a fairly long and detailed manifesto uh, on their viewpoints, uh, including uh, different views, uh, including the replacement theory, this idea that uh, the Democrats are attempting to kind of dilute the white vote uh, by bringing in immigrants uh, to vote for uh, vote for the Democrats. Uh, and so, you know, right after uh, that news account came out, uh, or not the news account, the, the, the incident, uh, the shooting uh, in Buffalo, uh, we got the Fox News report here saying Buffalo uh, shooting, MSNBC, ABC, Rolling Stone, and others exploiting pain using tragedy uh, to trash opponents. Uh, because they're talking about uh, the arguments uh, that were involved with the manifesto uh, and, you know, an argument that's been made uh, on the other side of the aisle, the other side of uh, the political spectrum, uh, kind of summarized here within this NPR article, uh, what is the great replacement and how is it tied to the Buffalo shooter, uh, shooting suspect, uh, saying, okay, you know, there, there is something going on. This, something happened to this individual uh, that caused him to have this viewpoint. Uh, and then finally, a Bloomberg article here uh, from pretty much that same week uh, talking about uh, what's occurred in Europe uh, in their efforts to fight online radicalization. You know, when we talk about radicalization, you know, we, we often talk about it uh, with Islam and, and terrorism, uh, but we can see that same type of radicalization occurring when people are only hearing one viewpoint uh, and becoming almost militarized to support uh, and advance uh, that viewpoint. Uh, so that, that was a perspective. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last straw for me that you know, kind of pushed me into this, and it was a, not necessarily a good week to be doing this uh, from my perspective, uh, but I, I felt we'd gotten to the point we could. Uh, earlier this week, uh, and again, I'm not even sure what day it is, it's Sunday the 29th, uh, last week, the beginning of the week, uh, we had another uh, atrocious school shooting. You know, 19 elementary uh, students killed, uh, two teachers, uh, in, a, in a repeat that is, it is it, it, I, just, I don't even know what to say. It's just incredibly, incredibly disturbing uh, and upsetting and emotional and just all kinds of, uh, I'm sorry about that, all, all kinds of emotions. Uh, but but it, immediately, it, you know, we see the same type of polarization that's going to be going on here. Uh, a Fox 13 article uh, in the day, and again, I'm re uh, recording this less than a week after the incident. There is a lot of information that continues to come out almost on a daily basis now. Uh, there needs to be a full investigation as to, you know, what happened, why it happened, what was the response, all of those things. So I'm, I'm you know, potentially jumping into this a little bit early, but I also don't want this to, you know, kind of get away from our, our mindset. Uh, and, and so we take a look at this, Governor Abbott uh, from Texas, uh, saying that the shooter bought two rifles uh, after turning 18, had no known mental health history, uh, and that 
it seems to have held up. Uh, it was early reported that it, it seems, at least at this point, it's still being reported. Uh, but then if you take a look at the response, uh, you've got President Biden and others calling for tougher gun controls uh, as a result uh, of this school shooting. Uh, where well, you've got other people, uh, and you know, in, in the terms of bad timing, if you want to think about it that way, or ironic timing, uh, the National Rifle Association had their national convention uh, the same week as the shooting. Uh, a number of speakers there, including former President Trump, uh, you know, talking about you know, it, it's not the guns that was the issue; it was you know, the lack of school security. You know, we need to have you know, lock in and harden uh, our schools, you know, into fortresses to protect them. You know, talking about, you know, potential that, you know, it's a mental health issue as opposed to a gun issue, even though there's no evidence, uh, at least at this point, uh, that mental health um, was a concern uh, ahead of time. Uh, and so we see these, you know, these very polarized views. We see these very different perspectives uh, that are being presented um, to much of the populace as factual information. But... They have very different spins associated, very different perspectives associated with it. Uh, and, and so this, you know, reminded me, uh, and again, I'm a little bit older now. Uh, I grew up, uh, I guess, of the Walter Cronkite uh, generation. Uh, he was on in the evening news, you know, 6.30 p.m. You know, you'd, you'd turn on the news, and, and there was Walter Cronkite, yeah, Cronkite, um, with the news. Uh, and in preparing this slide, uh, I was actually looking uh, for this quote over here, freedom of the press is not just important to democracy, it is democracy, because we need to be able to know what is going on in the world. Uh, and it's dependent upon us to be able to have a realistic view about what's going on in the world. You know, I, you know I'm a scientist, uh, I'm an educator, uh, I know my topics you know, pretty well, but there's a whole lot of information out there that I don't know. Uh, and I'm dependent upon getting that information from another source. Uh, I don't, you know, you know, I'm sitting up here in Pennsylvania. I don't know what's going on in Washington. I don't know what's going on in Ukraine. I'm not sure what's going on in other regions of the world. So I'm dependent upon watching the news uh, and reading reports, uh, news reports, other reports, uh, as to what's going on in the world. Uh, and as I was finding the democracy quote, uh, I found this quote over here, and I, I didn't realize that Cronkite said this, uh, but again, it fits in really well, uh, and so I'm going to kind of break my principles and, and put two quote sides, uh, put two quotes from Cronkite uh, up here where I, I would normally only have done one. Uh, the ethic of the journalist, uh, and I would say the professional journalist as well as the citizen journalist, the, the commentators, everybody that's involved with this, uh, the ethic of the journalist is to recognize one's prejudices, biases, and avoid getting them into print. You know, we have so many people dependent upon the information that we make available to them that we need to make sure that that information is presented in a, a fair uh, way, that, you know, we can trust the information that is being presented to us. Uh, and, and so, again, to, to take a look at the, the disparity in the information that is out there. Uh, I, I mentioned Ukraine a couple minutes ago. Uh, we're looking at the, again, the horrific uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is now started in mid-March. It's now mid-May. Uh, it, it's going on over, you know, two and a half months now. I think we have the 100-day anniversary. So I guess I'll make it more than three day, three months. Um, basically, it's going on for, for way, way, way too long. Uh, but if you take a look at this, uh, uh, very early on, uh, NPR and a number of other uh, news sources, uh, again, of trusting these news sources, you know, hopefully they're accurate, uh, talking about how the propaganda in the news system in Russia uh, is altering the view of the Russian public as to what that war was. Uh, it started out with uh, a liberation of um, Russian-speaking people uh, in Ukraine, liberating the country uh, from Nazis, uh, and uh, looking at this as, as a huge success. The New York Times uh, a few weeks ago had a more detailed uh, account on that. Uh, and again, I, I blew this up a little bit because I wanted to make reference to it, uh, to the Western audiences, to us uh, that are viewing it from the outside. Uh, the invasion, Russian invasion, uh, has been uh, seen as a series of blunders, you know, lots of problems, not making a lot of progress, uh, and in many cases being driven back uh, by the Ukrainian people. 
Uh, but the, the news that's coming out of Russia, again, recognize that uh, Russia has a state-run television network uh, that basically says what the government wants it to say. Uh, and to the point where a critical reporting of the war has been criminalized. Uh, people can be arrested and put in jail uh, for speaking against Putin and for speaking against uh, the war uh, in Ukraine and what's going on within Ukraine. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's incredibly troubling, especially to us uh, within the United States, with our free press, uh, around the world, where we see the importance of the, the free flow of information, the accurate information getting out uh, to our citizens. But then again, we, we take a look at this and we see, you know, the censorship that's occurring in Russia by only having one point of view. Uh, but then you look at how many of us uh, get our information. We get our information from social media. Uh, I use a couple of news aggregator sites uh, and I've actually looked into it. Uh, some of these news aggregator sites use the same basic type of algorithms uh, to go through uh, and see what it is you like and give you more information like that. Uh, so a couple articles, uh, research articles. Um, this is a, a reference to an article uh, in Silence, Science Daily. Uh, and, and so there was a research study saying that basically computer algorithms really change our view uh, of the world. Uh, and, and it's basically the same thing over here in another uh, science article, basically saying that the, the way that the information is presented to us uh, doesn't always show us the alternative viewpoint, doesn't always show us differing perspectives and different views uh, about what's going on. So that oftentimes, whether or not we're on social media or some of these news aggregator sites, they're going to be giving you information and news accounts that are more like the articles that you've read in the past. Uh, and so the computer program works intentionally to say, okay, if you like this perspective before, here's more articles with that perspective. Uh, and so what ends up with is that it's almost, almost like a, a self-censorship type mechanism occurring when we're using these algorithms, if we're not intentionally going out and looking for a, a variety of information. Uh, and that gives rise finally to, you know, what are the epistemic bubbles and the echo chambers that we talked about. Basically, within an epistemic bubble, uh, we're taking a look at an individual being within a community or within a situation where their opposing viewpoints, important relevant viewpoints, have been excluded by omission. Uh, so you have an individual over here uh, that is living in a protected environment, protected from kind of outside views uh, and outside influences. Uh, and so a good example of this, uh, and this again, a, a news report from earlier this week, uh, in Virginia, uh, we've got um, Virginia lawmakers uh, trying to restrict the ability of the uh, book uh, distributor, uh, Barnes & Noble bookstore, uh, from selling uh, 2021's most banned book. Uh, basically saying, you know, you know, we're going to ban the book from the schools, we're going to try to ban the book from the libraries, uh, but now we're, we're, we're going to try to prevent people from being able to purchase it and, and read it. If you get into the legislation, it's basically uh, uh, saying that they can't sell it to minors, uh, that they would have to have parental approval uh, for them to be able to do it. Uh, but we're still looking at this idea of banning ideas uh, and preventing those ideas from getting into the bubble uh, and exposing those people to, you know, differing viewpoints, potentially important viewpoints that are needed. The alternative of the epistemic uh, bubble you know, is an echo chamber. Uh, and so within the echo chamber, same basic idea. We've got an individual sitting here kind of exposed to, you know, whatever viewpoint uh, is favorable within that community or within that group. Uh, but then it is actively attempting to discredit uh, those views that are contrary to their viewpoint, uh, and there's those views that are potentially going to challenge that viewpoint. Uh, and so, you know, an issue, you know, you know, don't believe them. It's it's a conspiracy theory. Don't believe them. It's it's part of this Basque, you know, conspiracy. There's you know a, a plan in place to you know uh, change what it is that, that's going on in the world, and, and we're not going to tell you what's going on. Uh, the whole issue of, of fake news. Uh, Monkeypox uh, is a virus that uh, has been around for a number of years, uh, flares up every once in a while. Uh, we're once again seeing it kind of emerging you know, kind of across Europe uh, as well as the United States now uh, at a higher level than we've seen it uh, in the past. So there are concerns about it. 
Uh, but then if you go on social media, there are claims that um, monkeypox is fake news. Uh, and the reason for that is that they're showing that, you know, some of the news accounts, uh, some of the pictures from the news accounts uh, are very similar, uh, and in many cases the same uh, as has been used in the past. And therefore, if they are reusing these images, uh, it must be a, a conspiracy. It must be fake. Uh, the, you know, the fact checkers, and this is a, a Reuters fact checker article kind of associated with it, says, yeah, it is the same article. You know, newspapers, uh, journalists, citizen journalists, uh, I'm not sure what I am. I, I'm a biology professor doing some of these things. You know, I, I look for images that I have available or images that I can find. Uh, there are libraries of, of images that are available to news agencies. Uh, so they're not going to go out and get a new image every time a new news account occurs. Uh, so they're going to use stock images. Um, hopefully, you know, recognize it as a stock image uh, and not purport it to be, you know, kind of live. So, you know, you often see, you know, battle scenes, uh, but they're battle scenes taken from another area uh, while they're talking about, you know, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and it's not, you know, an attempt to mislead the person. It's just to fill in with additional information for footage that they don't necessarily have. Uh, and, and so with this idea of echo chamber, you know, you, you take an individual that's, that's in the inside of this echo chamber uh, and, you know, they may get exposed to uh, uh, external information. So they, you know, they may be sitting in here with this epistemic bubble, uh, you know, uh, they're in there, the information has been omitted, so they don't have access to it. Here, you know, the information may get in, but they're not even going to consider it. They're not going to consider the source uh, because it's already been a... Uh, um, it's already been discredited. You know, don't believe them. They're going to come out and they're going to lie to you. Uh, I don't know what they're going to say, but as soon as they speak, they're going to be lying to you. So don't trust a word that they say. Uh, and we've seen that uh, over the last uh, well, probably five or six years, uh, especially. Uh, but this concept of fake news, you know, don't trust anything they say because they're going to say things about me that, um, you know, aren't good, that, you know, are, aren't true. You shouldn't believe them just solely because they're talking uh, against me. Uh, and, you know, so we have this situation then that how do we trust the information uh, that we have? Uh, and, you know, I don't do this a lot, uh, but I encourage you to read this article. It's uh, from a um, uh, kind of a psychology and a marketing perspective, but Escape the Echo Chamber. Uh, it's a relatively short read. It's an essay. Uh, I think it's a psychologist that wrote it. Uh, but it's a really, really good article from my perspective in taking a look at, you know, how do we interpret perspectives and how do we, you know, kind of analyze if we are getting good information. Uh, and that gives rise to my ethical dilemma in science for this week, a little bit more on the ethics and, and different perspectives, a little bit less on the science. Uh, but this idea that the First Amendment protects the freedom of the press. Uh, but what does that mean now in this internet age of social media and citizen journalists? What makes someone a reliable source of information that you can trust? If you find information on the web, is it reliable or is it just, you know, the, the equivalent of the Buffalo shooter writing a manifesto? Uh, and they, you know, they have issues and, and we shouldn't be trusting that information. Uh, how do you ensure that you're able to consider robust and accurate information? You know, you know, it's great if people agree with you, but if you're wrong, it might be good to have an alternative viewpoint. How do we know what's right and what's wrong if we don't consider the information fully? Uh, and then finally, you know, potentially a little bit controversial in this, are there times or portions in an individual's life when it's appropriate uh, to remain within an echo chamber or an epistemic bubble? You know, we can't, you know, tilt at all the windmills that, that we see appearing uh, before us. Uh, but are there certain things that we just accept? You know, you know, maybe I don't have the best information from that, but I feel comfortable with it. Uh, but are there times that, you know, we definitely need to be challenging those things that we're going to be thinking about? A few articles, including the Escape from the uh, Echo Chamber. I'll put this in the links uh, in the, um, the description uh, down below. So uh, thank you. Again, gone off in a slightly different direction, went a little bit longer uh, than I planned on this. I, I tended for this to be relatively short, uh, but the more that I got into it, the more kind of emotional and the more kind of important I felt uh, that this was going to be. So hopefully uh, you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll have another one next week. I'm working on one right now that I, I bump back to next week. Get back to a little bit of the science and the, the ethics associated with it. So thank you. Have a great week. Uh, and hopefully uh, come back for another Ethical Dilemma in Science soon.